All right. Male hegemony is male domination, male control. Men controlled the society, which they mostly did at that time. Um, we've seen women couldn't go to university, women couldn't be doctors or lawyers or things like that. Women could get an education sometimes, but very often they couldn't use it even if they got it. And it wasn't until the 19th century, really, that things started to change in that respect. So we're looking at a society that's very, very male-dominated. And it's before the time that we usually think of as being when feminism got going. But as I said in the last class, when we talked about women at this time, there were some quite strong kind of pushes by women towards saying, well, you know, you have to listen to us. And one of the big ones was the uh, Cro Civil War, Cromwell, uh, the government against the king, parliament against the king, and women saying, we don't want this war. Mostly because it's not good for the economy and it, it's going to hurt our pockets. We're not going to be able to feed our children if you keep on fighting, so please stop. So that was an important step. But what I want to look at today was how women actually wrote about things and published what they wrote about so that other you know, people in the society could read, read, read what they wrote and <clears throat> what kinds of things they wrote. And like I said last week, this is an important part of history for me, the voices from the past. What did they say? We talked about what they did or some of what they did. Uh, so this week I'd like to look at some of the things that they said and they, that they wrote about. And it's not just about women, it's about how men saw women. This was a time when men were very deeply suspicious of women. Okay, They saw women as much more likely to be evil. Uh, most of the witches that were, you know, accused people who were accused of being witches, most of them were women. And so it was an age when men were deeply suspicious of women. And at the same time, the role of the man, surprisingly, because we don't connect it with feminism, but the role of the man is being challenged by women. You've got, as we say, we've got women as monarchs. Somebody asked about that, I put it in the blog. Women as queen, you know, it's sort of, they're, they're the power figure. That's a challenge to the normal way of thinking. Women as martyrs dying for what they believed. Uh, women as writers, and this is where I'm particularly coming coming in today with women as writers and the things that they wrote. And here's an example of the, the way that men thought about it, how they felt, oh, these women, you know, how frightening they are when they start to push into our area. Because men are used to, it's all our area. They're used to that idea. The public space belongs to men. Women belong in the private space. They belong in their home. Here's the sort of thing that we get. Ben Jonson, a very famous playwright, not as famous as Shakespeare, obviously, but from that period, complains of ladies that live from their husbands, separate from, away from, not, not depending on their husbands, and cry down or up what they like or dislike in a brain or a fashion with most masculine or rather hermaphroditical authority. They act like men or they act like somebody who's both, both man and woman, together. And he, he's frightened of it, okay, these women. They, they, um, they, they say what they think. They say what they like. They say what they don't like. You know, he's used to women being sunao, being obedient and, and, and docile and, and shutting up. And they don't, okay? They say what they think. They say what they feel. And he's shocked by it. And this is actually not an English woman, but you can see the kind of thing. Um, the, she, she's, she's showing as much of her breast, or she's probably showing more of her breast than she should there. Uh, she, she's smoking. She doesn't care what anybody thinks about her. Okay? Uh, I couldn't find quite as good a picture of, of a woman from the 
from England at that time, but I think this is something that was going on all across Europe, or in many parts of Europe, especially the northern part of Europe. Women were just saying, well, this is me. You know, I, live, I, I, I do what I like, I live as I like, I show myself as I like. It's not anybody else's business. Which we, we sort of think now, well, that's not how we might. Uh, in our society now, but in those days, it was very shocking for people like Ben Johnson that there would be a person like this. And we got an interesting publication coming out called, uh, there were two, two of them, two little publications. One was The Man Woman, okay, and the other one was The Womanish Man. <laughs> They're talking about gender, right back there in the... Uh, you know, early modern period, just as intently as we talk about it today. The whole idea that, you know, I grew up in a society where it's normal. You tick a box that said you were male, or tick another box that said you were female. There are only two boxes. Okay? But we know that sexuality is a spectrum. Nobody is 100%, um, you know, uh, Masculine and nobody is 100% fit. We're all, we're, all, we're, all, we're all along a spectrum. Okay, we have to decide. No, you have to, you're on this side or you're on that side. And uh, right back there in the early modern period, they're talking about that as well. All right, you've got some men who are more dang side, techie, okay? You've got some women who are more jossy, techie. You've got masculine women and feminine men. And uh, this, this was published in 1620, and that gives an idea of the way that they were looking at gender and talking about it. And here's something that was written in, in, in one of these publications. We are as freeborn as men. Okay, this is the womanish man here. Yeah. Uh, sorry, no, it shouldn't be. It should be the... It should be the, it should be the, the, the of a mannish woman, shouldn't it, speaking. It's a woman speaking, saying, we are as freeborn as men. We have as free election and as free spirits. We are compounded of like parts and may with like liberty make benefit of our creations. So there, women are saying, you know, we, have, we should have the same rights. We're the same as men. We, we, we are equally human. And they're saying it right back there in the early 17th century. So, here's an interesting thing about attitudes in those days. Today, if a, if a, if a man dresses up as a woman, people can go, ooh, you know, sometimes, ooh, look at that, you know, a man dressed up as a woman. But in those days, they didn't really care very much. If a man wanted to dress as a woman, that was his business. But a woman dressing as a man? You're taking my position, you're taking my authority, you're challenging my identity, right? They took that seriously, all right? So the way of thinking was like almost the opposite from today, where they paid a lot more attention to women dressing as men. We said that in Shakespeare it happens a lot, but they've always, or nearly always, they've got a good reason for it. They're doing it because they, 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 they need to get into a man's world in order to find uh, their missing brother or in order to pretend to be a lawyer uh, so that they can argue a case or they have a moral reason for doing it. But just acting like a man, you know, out in the street like that, very shocking, very challenging. So uh, there's an example of a uh, very different way of thinking from today because women who dressed as men were seen to be challenging the, the men. Unsex me here. Lady Macbeth very famously says, unsex me here. Take away my, my sex, my, fem my, my female identity. So that was another idea that women, when they were being women, would be naturally just a techie, woman-like. And what did that mean? It meant gentle, Sunal, obedient, docile, uh, sweet. How are you? Okay. Uh, when Lady Macbeth says, unsex me here, she's throwing all those things aside. 
so that she can be cruel, she can kill. And that means that she's making herself like a man. It's one of the things that they commented about with um, Mary, Queen Mary, the, the one who uh, burned all those Protestants. How could a woman do something like that? It's not what a woman does. Acts of cruelty, acts of violence, were seen as something that was basically what a man does. It wasn't the image that women could, could be just as violent or could, could be just as cruel and uh, ijiwaru, uh, evil, nasty, as, as men are. So the part of the image of women is interesting because on the one side there's the idea that ijiwaru can come into a woman more easily because you know, she, took the snake from, she took the apple from the snake. So on one side a woman can be more evil, but the natural nature of a woman is uh, much more gentle than that of a man. And so when Lady Macbeth says, unsex me here, take away my woman the qualities of gentleness and kindness. And she says, uh, come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall. Instead of milk, give me blood. <laughs> Shocking idea. Uh, and she, so she's opening up her woman's heart to cruelty and evil. A bit like the witches in the same story in Macbeth, there are witches, and they've said that her husband will become king, but his road to becoming king is a bloody road where he kills to get power. And even more than the 16th century, the 17th century was a, a time when witchcraft and, and that kind of uh, hatred of women, because mostly... Uh, the witchcraft attack, you know, the hunting of witches was against women. Um, hundreds were tortured, they were put to death, believing that they were agents of the devil. And basically, we, we talked about this a bit, that it comes from Christian culture because it was the the woman, Eve, who first took the apple in the Garden of Eden. So women were seen as more, more of the body. Right? And more emotional, of course, more emotional. I mean, again, even now, I think there's this idea that women, can, women are emotional. Women can be emotional. Um, you know, you, you still hear it quite often. Natanai de otokodatara. Okay? You're not supposed to show your emotions if you're male. Don't cry, you're a boy. So that kind of attitude. So, uh, here's a writer in the late 16th century. Obviously, really, th this hatred and suspicion of women comes out here. Uh, the common scum. Okay, scum, like the really gummy of women are so proud, so foolish, so shrewish. The shrew was a, a, a very small creature, uh, but famous for being very uh, fierce. So imperious over their husbands. They, they, they want to rule, the women want to rule their husbands. Okay, again, this suspicion. If the woman gets any kind of power, any kind of control, she will misuse it. And for enticements of the flesh, Okay, this belief that women could more easily be um, made. Women can't say no to, to for example, if, if another man looks at your wife, she'll sleep with him. Of course she will. She doesn't have morality. She's a woman. Okay, she doesn't use her head. She doesn't use her heart. Oh, he's a nice looking man. I'll sleep with him. That kind of suspicion that a woman would always give herself to another man, very kind of deep in uh, the uh, psyche or the psychology of male uh, shinpai, male anxiety about women. Uh, she's prone to lust. She's, um, she has untamed and unbridled con concupiscence. That's her sexual appetite, is her concupiscence. Um, they may well be tired, but never satisfied. 
with sex. Okay, they'll keep going until they're tired, but they'll never be satisfied. They'll always have room for more. He, he, he is very fearful of women's sexuality. He deeply suspects it. He, yeah, he's terrified by that. Okay. Uh, this kind of hatred of women is quite often expressed in the literature of those days. And part of it is connected with looking back at the two Seiji Dai, looking back at the Middle Ages, because in the Middle Ages, the image, the reality of the Middle Ages is different, okay? But the image that they, that Jiroroku uh, Junana Seiki, the people had in the 16th and 17th century, the image they had of the medieval time was a time when men were men. They were heroes. They were knights in armor on their horses. And women were, you know, like the perfect image of women. They were sunao and they were, you know, they, they, they knew their position. And they would be, the, the, the typical image is the woman who's being trapped by some kind of ijiwaru and she's in the top of the castle there and she, she's got a little white handkerchief that she, she puts out of the window so people can see uh, and that the hero will come and he'll rescue her. And, really, and men could be men in the two Seiji Dai. Of course, the reality was never like that, but that's the image that they had. That's how they thought about it. Okay? So, uh, you know, in the past, the only time in, that middle age, in the Middle Ages that a man would be lower than a woman would, he, would be when he would get on his knee and say, will you marry me? Will you have me? Okay? And it was largely symbolic. He puts himself in that lower position, but as soon as she says yes, it's back to, well, you can wash the dishes, and you can look after the house, and you can look after the children, and I'm the boss here. So just that one moment of sort of uh, putting himself in the lower position, but it, it, it was, as I say, mostly symbolic. But then you see, for the early modern period, comes the shinpai, the anxiety. Suppose she says, suppose she says no. In the stories of the Middle Ages, she would never say no. Okay, she would have to uh, accept him, really, if he was of a suitable level. So, yeah, here you've got the typical kind of the man lowering himself before the woman, asking for her hand in marriage. This is a sort of medieval image. Now, whether it was really like that, well, no, it, it wasn't ever really like that. But the point is that people looked back and imagined a time when men could be men, men could be heroes. And... Uh, that's the image that they have of this kind of Orgon Jidai of the past, of the true Seiji Dai. But you've got the 16th century, okay, you've got the true Seiji Dai, you've got the 16th century, and then you've got the 17th century. The 16th century, you've got women being burned for their beliefs and being powerful. You've got two powerful women who were queen and controlling the country, Mary and Elizabeth. So that kind of really changes the picture. And so 17th century women could look back on those women who were burned as martyrs. They could look back on Elizabeth and Mary and they could take strength from that. And men were being compared unfavorably for example, I think we said that uh, King James uh, was described as being like a woman. We, 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 we used to have King Elizabeth, and now we've got Queen James. All right, He's a womanish man. She was a mannish woman. The, man, the woman actually is better, a better man than the, than the man. Okay? So men are being challenged in their kind of gender identity in the 17th century. Um, Samuel Butler, a 17th century writer, talks about the same kind of thing. Uh, his English is a little bit difficult. Or means over. 
Uh, but the basic important here is we've got greedy women fighting to extend their vast dominion, to extend their empire, to, to, to make their control get bigger. When wives, their sexes shift like hairs. They used to believe that a hair could change from male to female. A hair is a, a, like a big rabbit walking on its own. Um, they used to believe that a hair could change from male to female. And women could do that. One minute she's a woman and then she can change and become a kind of man. And ride their husbands like nightmares. Nightmare, have you thought of that word nightmare? A mare is a type of horse, a female horse. Okay, and a nightmare is like, you, it's, you're, it's, it's, it, it's riding you into a kind of, you know, Horrible imagination. Women ride their husbands. They ride them like horses. Okay, they control their husbands. For when men by their wives are cowed, their horns, of course, are understood. Now, horns means uh, if, if, if we, we don't see it in England anymore. In Spain, people step, still do this. They show this or they show this, and it means your wife sleeps with other men. Okay. You have horns. I don't know why that you know having horns means that your wife sleeps with other men, but that's that's what it is, and that's what he's talking about here. The, these men, of course, their wives all sleep with other men, and again, this fear, this suspicion that a woman will always do that if she has the chance. And so, sexual insecurity is a big part of the early modern way of thinking. They, they, they are not confident. They, um, the confidence of being a hero in the true sage you die, and uh, of, of course I can attract a woman to me, and she will be true to me because I'm great. Uh, that kind of confidence seems to be missing in 17th century men, most of them. Most of what they write seems to show a kind of anxiety about the whole thing. Maybe she'll say no. Uh, you know, maybe she doesn't love me. And if she, even if she says yes, will she sleep with other men? You know, so it's all very kind of basic and showing a kind of insecurity about uh, women. Men, are, basically, I suppose it's coming from the fact that men are realizing that they cannot control women. And once women are out of their control, there's the fear of what will they do. And here's a, a woman now writing in the 17th century talking exactly about that situation where the lover is told, no, the woman says, I don't want you. O cruel nymph, a nymph just means like a woman, why dost thou thus delight to torture me? Why do you enjoy hurting me? Why thus my sufferings slight? Why do you laugh at my suffering? My mournful songs neglected are by thee. You don't listen. I'm crying. I'm, I'm, I'm in pain. I'm suffering because of you, and you don't even listen to me. Thou art regardless of my verse and me. You don't pay any attention. Thou canst behold with an unpitying eye my sorrows. You can look on me and you don't care that I'm suffering and you're pleased to see me die. Okay, so here's a woman writing about this um, exact situation uh, and about the, 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 the fear that the man has of the woman saying no, the fear that the woman will be cruel to him and that she will be happy to see him die. It's interesting that, you know, she's the woman taking on the... She's writing from the point of view of the man, isn't she? She's, she's imagining being the man talking to the woman. All right? Putting herself in the man's position there. And we've got lots of examples of this kind of thing in the literature of this period. Maybe the most striking of them all is... Uh, a woman called Afra Ben, an extraordinary woman, 
one of, I think, possibly the first English woman to earn her living from writing. And we don't know very many of the details of her life, but it seems that she had an extraordinary life, that she, she traveled to, so she had some time of her childhood in South America, which she writes about in one of her most famous books. Uh, we don't really know the details of it, but she seems like an extraordinary woman. And she writes one poem, okay, this is really, you know, uh, when I was uh, in kind of your sort of age, it was, the, it was sort of the late 1960s, early 1970s, there was a sort of sexual revolution going on then. Before that, there was like the 19th century, the Victorian period, you couldn't really talk about sex very much, you know, and uh, um, in the early 20th century, a lot of the writing about sex was kind of hidden. I put it there again. Right? They, they didn't openly talk about, like, this is sex. They talk about something else and said, well, how is your? <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, but they wouldn't openly talk about it like that. So the 1960s was a time for kind of opening things up. So we sort of think, you know, my image was, oh, Zutta Mukashi, they never talked about sex, okay? Uh, they started to talk about sex in the 1960s. Well, no. It's, it comes in waves, okay? If you go back to the 17th century, they were very open compared to the, the Victorian period. So it seems like it, it goes, you know, the ability to talk about the, whether it's taboo or not, uh, change, it, it's not a straight line. Of development, it, it seems to be some periods are more, you know, uh, censored and, and there's taboo, and other periods it's much more open. So was, I was very surprised to find out how openly this woman could write about sex in um, the 17th century. The poem is called The Disappointment. Uh, she describes a man's failure to maintain an erection. He can't do it while making love. Uh, I, don't want to go, <laughs> I don't want to go into too many details, it could get embarrassing, but uh, the, the poem ends like this. He cursed his birth, his fate, his stars, but more the shepherdess's charms. It's a shepherdess, you know, um, she's looking after the sheep and uh, he sees her in the countryside and they want to make love, okay? But, but they can't, because he can't. And uh, her soft, bewitching influence had damned him to the hell of impotence. She was so beautiful that she, she made him desire her, but then when he was with her, he couldn't actually perform the sex act. Uh, again, it's, that's probably every man's deepest fear. But, but uh, you wouldn't be, you would, you, you, you would get what you wanted, you'd get the woman you wanted, and then you'd mess it all up. So uh, she's read, written about it completely openly, uh, very directly, with, with no hidden meanings. It's all completely open and, and clear, and we can understand it. There's a lot of writing like this by women showing the insecurity of men, the, the anxiety that she implied that men suffer in their relationship to women. And there's a lot of writing by men saying, yes, yes, we are. We feel threatened by you women. You women are kind of kawaii. Okay, so it's, it's interesting how all of that is being spoken about in a very open kind of way through the literature of the 17th century. What have we got here? It's especially... Interesting when you think that go back to the 16th century, all that women wrote about, most of the you know, women writers wrote about religion. That's all. Okay. You didn't get women writing about sex or writing about anything very much, except, except religion. I mean, one or two did, but, but mostly the writing of women was about religion. Suddenly, just you know, in the next century, You've got women writing in very, very clear detail about sexual topics and quite sensitive sexual topics as well. Um, there's a, another very interesting work written by a woman 
called uh, The Countess of Montgomery's Urania, which was published in 1621. It's a long uh, romance. It's like a, a romance. It's like a kind of novel. Uh, it's set in a sort of fantasy world. Uh, it's set in that kind of Tuesday thing where men are men and women are women. <laughs> uh, you've got some strong women, but everybody's kind of on a heroic kind of level. And uh, it's, it's famous for its uh, erotic passages. Uh, a lot of them are... Uh, um, yeah, the sort of almost yeah, sadomasochistic, I would say. You know, you've got you know, all these adventures where women get tied up and tortured, and, or men sometimes get tied up and tortured. And the, 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 it's all it's a lot. A lot of it is, and, and other people are watching it and the satisfaction they get, or why they do it from watching it, and all of that is talked about. She was the her Obasan, her her aunt was the author of um, some translations of the. Uh, the Psalms, uh, say, say Shono, poems from the Bible. She translated those poems into a very beautiful translation into English with her brother. And here, you know, her, her niece is writing this shockingly kind of explicit sexual material only a few years later. So it's this extraordinary change in, in the society that, that, that's taking place. Um, and that there wasn't there wasn't much public reaction. Nobody sort of said, "Oh, this is terribly shocking. This is awful." Um, you know, pe people sort of, "Oh, yeah, you know, she's she's writing about that." It seems that the 17th century was a pretty open kind of time. People knew about sex. People talked about sex. It was much more natural, maybe even than it is in our world today, where we still have some of the Victorian kind of taboo. Um, and the book, in the end, was taken out of publication, but not because it was erotic. Nobody seemed to have a problem with the eroticism of the book. It was taken out of publication, it was taken out of circulation because it had characters who seemed to be characters in real life. It's true, it's true. She did use real life people and put them into the story. Okay, and people could read it, and if they knew that person, they said, "Chop them up." That's what happened to this person. That's this person, isn't it? And those people said, "We don't like. We don't like her doing that." So, for that reason, the book was taken out of publication, taken out of circulation, um, and not many people were able to read it because only a, after only a few hundred or a few thousand people had read it, it was pulled back. Okay, most copies went back, and. Uh, a few copies survived, that's how we know today uh, that it existed. Um, but it's interesting that it, it wasn't because of the sexual content that the book was uh, taken out of publication. It's because of, um, she was talking in too much reality. <laughs> people could see that the people in her book were actually real people. And that was a kind of scandal. Uh, in one of the most famous passages, you've got um, the hero and his sweetheart. They find uh, an Ijiwaru guy tormenting his wife, Limena. She's, he's, she's, he's down by the beach and he's torturing her. And he, it's, they found him just at the time when he's going to torture her to death. And the description we get is uh, very kind of er erotic. So just give you an example of the kind of thing you've got. Leading her to a pillar which stood on the sand, he tied her to it by the hair, which was of great length and sunlight brightness. Then pulled he off a mantle which she wore, leaving her from the girdle upwards all naked. Her soft, dainty white hands he fastened behind her with a cord about both wrists in a manner of a cross as testimony of her cruelest martyrdom. When she was thus miserably bound to this unmerciful, unmerciful like to his unmerciful liking, with whips he was about to torment her. Um, and really, you know, if you found that something like that in a modern novel, you'd say, well, yeah, you know, this is a pornographic novel. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it's really kind of cl too close for us to, to, to pornography. But they didn't have the idea of pornography in the 16th century, or even in the 17th century. It was in, only in the 18th century that 
they started to think that pornography was something you could publish things that people shouldn't be reading because it's sexual. So uh, that, that's the kind of thing that he writes. She writes in her book, and of course they rescue her, and then she she gives details of all the things that he did. I, I won't go into too much detail about it, but but she's sort of saying, "Oh look what he did to my breasts," and she's holding her breasts up for for the hero to see, you know, her, her tortured breasts and so on. It's, it's it's all very very explicit. It's all said very directly and clearly. Um, so yeah, she she lets the mantle fall to show her breasts so that he can see how they've been how he's tortured her. <clears throat> so descriptions like this have led to you know modern critics are uh, it's really shocking for modern especially for feminists. They're thinking here's the first major book written by a woman, the first major work of fiction written by a woman. And it's basically pornographic, <laughs> okay? And especially, it shows lots of violence against women. That's kind of, ooh, a shock for feminists, <laughs> because they, they, they don't imagine that a woman is going to write about violence against women. Um, I think that's the wrong way of understanding the book, personally, um, because if you look at it, it's got erotic passages where men are being tortured, and women are looking on. It's got homoerotic passages with homosexual things going on. It's got um, proud huntresses, powerful women who are hunters, and, and they're going out, you know, sometimes naked, sometimes not, but they're going out and hunting animals and all this kind of thing. It's, it's, uh, it, it's got all kinds of scenes in it, not just the, the very famous ones where women are being tortured by men, but uh, the opposite or other kinds of um, scenes showing kind of a sexualized violence. Uh, so I would say that it's a, a sort of celebration of female sexuality rather than um, women saying, you know, she's not sort of saying, I'm writing this book for men, so I'm going to give them sexy stuff that men will like. It's more like I'm giving a... a I, I enjoy sex, and, and here, here's a whole range of sexual kind of scenes for anybody's enjoyment. She's clearly, I think she gets a lot of pleasure from writing it herself. She's enjoying writing this book. And then, uh, okay, pr pretty much, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end the class a little bit early today, but before we end, I'll talk about Afra Ben again. Remember, the, the one who wrote that poem about the man who couldn't have sex with the shepherdess. Um, we get um, a genre being started here by a woman. Uh, the genre of a novel written as letters. Okay, it, it was the first English novel that's a novel made of letters. Okay, she writes a letter to him, he writes a letter to her, Somebody else writes a letter to a different person, and, and the whole novel is just all the letters, just all brought together to make a story. This was the first time anybody had done this in the English language, and it was a woman who did it. Okay. It's a, quite a big thing in the history of literature, but I didn't learn that when I was at university. Okay. They didn't talk about these kinds of aspects in those days. It's becoming more and more you know, talked about now, the position of women uh, in literature at that time, but I never learned about this when I was at university. Uh, it's Again, it's a scandalous sort of thing, and it's also, it's the first epistolary novel, an epistolary novel, a novel that's written through letters, and uh, sorry, this that's irrelevant. I'll, I'll jump this, it's because this is, this is another uh, epistolary novel, also written by a woman, but it's 18th century, so jump pushing us. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to look at the Afro Ben's love letters. A again, she used a real life situation, but the real life people uh, was such a big, it was such a big, pop, you know, famous scandal that sono scandalo no futari e di uh, she was able to publish and write about it because they left the country, because the scandal was so big. 
Uh, but this is the scandal. This is the story that she's, she's, she's using the, the real scandal and putting it into her story. And basically, we've got a young man called Philander. Uh, which, it, it doesn't mean he likes loving. It means but it, it's like he likes loving different women. So we can suspect from the beginning that he's not going to be true to her. Uh, but he's married to a woman that he doesn't love, and he loves his wife's sister, Sylvia. Sylvia has said, you know, don't come near me. You know, you're married to my sister. Uh, but he's completely in love, and he can't stop himself. He writes a letter to Sylvia uh, saying uh, that, you know, please let us, uh, you know, let our love grow. All right, so there he is. He's got his beloved Syria, Sylvia, and uh, he's written a letter to her. Uh, well, they didn't, they didn't have email in those days, but uh, if he'd written it as an email, he might have written it like this. Okay. Well, this is, this is, this is, what, these are the words from the book. Though I parted from you resolved to obey your impossible commands, yet know, O oh charming Sylvia, that after a thousand conflicts between love and honour, I found the God too mighty for the idol, reign absolute monarch in my soul. Basically he's saying, love is more to me than honour. I don't care about my honour. I, I just, I, my love is everything. Uh, that cruel counsellor that would suggest to you a thousand fond arguments to hinder my noble pursuit. Sylvia came in view. Her irresistible idea, with all the charms of blooming youth, with all the attractions of heavenly beauty. See, she, he really loves his wife's sister. Loose, wanton, gay. Look at the words he's using about her. Loose, wanton, gay. The, these do not, the, wanton especially suggests that she's, again, that she's the kind of woman who would sleep with other men. And loose has the same kind of meaning. She's not a moral woman. You're, you're really sexy. And, and you know, uh, he, gets, he gets very exact, clear about it. It's white, small breasts, delicate neck, rising bosom. Um, you know, so uh, he, he's very, again, very explicit about the physical nature of her attractiveness. Oh, adorable Sylvia. And he keeps on, you know, uh, it's, it's quite a long le letter, uh, but it's got all these kind of sexual references in it, and mm, they have a weak alliance of brother and sister because he's the brother-in-law, okay? He's getting off uh, on, on his side, is that what he said, to, to, to Sylvia, because she's married to her sister. And he's saying, we don't have to care about that. What happened? Adam made Eve. Adam made, and this is another kind of interesting idea. Adam made Eve. And all humanity came from that. Uh-huh. So Adam and Eve had children. Who did those children sleep with? They must have slept with their own brothers and sisters in order to make the world full of people. So if you believe the Bible's story, sleeping with your brother and sister is not a problem. It happened in the Bible. Okay? So uh, he, uh, again, challenges that aspect of the um, relationship. Okay? Uh, what is it to my divine Sylvia that the priest took my hand and gave it to your sister? Uh, why should I care about that? Why should I be tied to eternal slavery by the words of a priest? Okay. And finally, he... Hello? What have we got? No, no, my charming maid. It's all nonsense. Let us scorn the dull beaten road. Let us love like the first race of men. So let's, again, going back, let's go back to an age when men could be men and women could be women and heroes could be heroes. And let's forget about the morality of this narrow, heisatikina, little world that we live in. Okay, I'll, I'll jump. Okay, and off goes, off his, his senses. 
sends his message, will she answer him? Well, firstly, uh, like I said, it, it, it is bit, in the 17th century, you were supposed to choose honor more than everything. You were supposed to die for honor. But here, uh, no, he chooses love against honor. Uh, should never bring dishonor. Any love that brings dishonor is not true love. So he, she's challenging the, the 17th century way of thinking here. Uh, words loose and wanton suggest sexual immorality, but uh, it's all, you know, here he wants her, even though she's loose and wanton. And, uh, yeah, okay, I've, I've talked about these points, so I won't carry on. Yeah, he's breaking one of the fundamental taboos of early modern society, the, the basic taboo, uh, it, marriage, marriages are made by God. Marriage is made by God. And yet he's saying, what should I care that some priest said that she's my wife? What, what should that matter to me? Marriage is supposed to be made by God in heaven. So he's going against God. But he doesn't care. Um, I'm going to jump this little bit here. There's too much detail here. So, basically, here's this woman writing about a man whose love challenges everything that the 17th century values. It goes against honor, it goes against religion, and she writes about it very directly, very clearly, very openly. And in the first part of the novel, you, we do feel that he is a kind of a hero. We do feel some, you know, we, we, yeah, you know, you should follow your heart. She makes, she makes the reader feel like that. So here we've got this novel that challenges everything that the 17th century believes in, and it's written by a woman. Okay, I think there's still much more to be said about Afro Ben and her uh, contribution to literature. I think she's an extraordinary writer. Okay, so... Um, I'm not going to push things too much more, and I'm going to let you go a little bit early today because, well, hey, <laughs> you've done you've done everything. But I hope you will find, um, you know, that this period is of some interest to you, and I hope you'll come back to it and maybe look at my pages again, you know, sometime in the future, in your life, or think about what we've studied here. Um, and and that's it, really. I wish you well. And I'm going to say goodbye. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. I think yes. I think there's only one person writing. Thanks. Yeah. Writing a term paper. But if anybody else has the idea of writing a term paper, please contact me and tell me what you're planning to do. You have until the end of the month if you want to write a paper. Okay. And we'll we'll bump the grade up.